go ahead and jump into it, Dominic. So like I said, first things first. I mean, you sent me a pretty impressive video to showcase your level of fandom. So, yeah. I mean, is this this is like a lifelong thing for you then? I mean, this goes back to probably, what, 77 when you were two or three years old? Uh, approximately about uh, 1980 there. I was five years old. I grew up in a town called Austin in New York. My mother, uh, she was a single mom. We didn't have much money. And I uh, vividly recall the cantina play set along with the 12 figures. Um, you know, at that time, we didn't have a million different types of oversaturated levels of entertainment. You know, we didn't have YouTube. We didn't have 20 million channels like we do now and uh, so many different forms of entertainment, so many streaming services. It all kind of streamlined into uh, George Lucas, who more or less was, I mean, so ahead of his time. And it just affected us in so many ways. It wasn't only the figures. It wasn't only the movie, but it was also the music. You know, John Williams, uh, a lot of times, of course, you know, he's given a, a million times credit. But also at the same time, I feel that music for children really pulls at your heartstrings almost before you're able to even spell or speak. Yeah, totally. Um, so for me, it just had a tremendous profound effect. Um, when I was six years old, I can vividly recall The Empire Strikes Back, uh, seeing it in the theaters in Yonkers, New York, at a, a movie theater called Movie Land. And it was a packed theater. And when you're watching a film like that, or you're watching a Spielberg film like, say, E.T., or uh, even, um, you know, a uh, 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 Goonies or, or what have you at that age, it just, you're, you're like a sponge. And the sense of urgency that the, and the magic of Harrison Ford and Mark Hamill and, and Carrie Fisher, in terms of the believability uh, and the credibility of this universe, when you see that at six years old, it just has such an effect on you. And it was just so refreshing. It was such a perfect movie in terms of the difference between good and evil and mythology. It was just so easy to digest. Um, that, so that that combined with the figures where we didn't have any of the other distractions on Saturdays and Sundays for maybe a, literally an hour or two, which is hard to imagine because my kids, I got them a place that when they were about seven or eight. And, and I mean, they threw it to the wayside in about two right. seconds and went right back to their iPad, you know? Um, <laughs> but those figures, you know, we've all had kind of that intimate experience with it. It, it became very special to us. You know, I, there was something about the intricacy. It wasn't only Lucas, but it was also his team in terms of creating these very unique looking uh, side characters, these bounty hunters, these you know, Greedo or Hammerhead or Walrus Man or Snaggletooth. I mean, exactly. it was just something to where it was so thought provoking in the most refreshing way as a child um, to to inspire our creativity uh, and to create optimism within our hope, uh, within our own lives. Excellent. So, Dominic, do you remember what exactly got you into Star Wars? Was it seeing an ad? Was it your mom? Was it friends? I mean, what, what was the first thing where you're like, OK, I got to go check this out? Yeah, I was five years old, you know, and it was a combination of things. I think even at that time when we went to, it was kind of like a Walmart, it was called Caldor, you know, the toy section for kids. I mean, it really was this big, huge section of Star Wars figures. So I, I didn't get a chance to see episode four in the theater, but you were pretty much even at that time kind of surrounded by it. And like I said, it was just the most refreshing experience because uh, it was so easy to digest, you know, the, the wanting to collect the figures and wanting to figure out each uh, figure. I remember we had an alphabet board. And just as I was learning to spell, uh, my mother would throw me words uh, of the side characters. I remember spelling Jawa. There you the go. <laughs> you know, this magnetic alphabet board. So we're surrounded by it. But, it, but it, you know, again, just the music of John Williams and just the magic of Empire to where it was coming from somewhere and it was going somewhere. Um, again, that just had such a profound effect for me as a kid, uh, just because, again, there was little to no oversaturation. I almost feel bad for the kids these days in terms of Marvel. I wonder if they have the same kind of empowered feeling or, or, the, or the same impact on their mind because there's so many, so much content, you know? Yeah. Uh, so Star Wars, it was so ahead of its time. I think before that, uh, people would agree that science fiction was kind of hokey and corny. Of um, course. Of, I think Al Gibnis didn't even want to do it because it's kind of like doing a B sci-fi movie uh, for Asylum, which unfortunately I did last year. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, it, 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 it was something that, you know, he really brought to the next level uh, with that special, with those special effects, and again, when you have that credibility, you create that universe, you create that world, and it continues to this day to where now, you know, you have Favreau and Filoni with this LED screen, where now for the new generation, they're creating that level of credibility, and it's so beautiful, uh, such an amazing uh, aspect of escapism for all of us. True, true. So, Dom, I mean, what what is your favorite movie at this point, or or how about trilogy? You can go either one. Uh, definitely the OT, but without question, Empire Strikes Back. Empire. Uh, just, yeah, I mean, just the arc of it. To me, what has made Star Wars special, what my hope is for Nine, is really going back to the lineage of the Skywalker uh, family as well as uh, family between light and good. Uh, it's it's like, you know, if you're performing in front of your family, you know, as far as people are, are now debating over what, you know, how the story should be, this and that. 
you know, your mom would come to you if you're going to go in front and make a, you know, make a speech in front of, you know, for an anniversary or 50th anniversary or your grandfather's 75th birthday. Everyone loves you already. All you have to do is show up and just sim simplify everything True. to what you are as a person and, and to honor that person. And it's the same thing with episode nine. I think JJ is going to do an amazing job with it. Just go back to what we love so much. And that's about mythology, believing in yourself, the light and the good. Um, and again, just about family, the connection. I, I grew up uh, you know, with just my mom. So the, the, the connection and the parallel to father and son uh, between Vader and, and Hamill, but even the brotherhood, you can go to the original, the, the prequels, um, the, the brotherhood of you were my brother, Anakin, you know, things like that to me is really what resonates. The, the reason Rogue One for me was so powerful was it was about relationships. It's not about, I'm actually not a sci-fi fan because it has nothing to do with spaceships and the pew, pew, pew. And, and don't get me wrong. I mean, I love <laughs> and everything else, but also at the same time, it would be nothing. You know, you can take any of these franchises and you know, these studios are scratching their head now. It has nothing to do. You can do Terminator. You can do whatever the hell you want. But if there's no substance to the characters I care about, if it True. has nothing to do with family or as far as anything that I can relate to, then then I'm lost. Yeah, who cares? Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. All right. So sticking with favorites, character. Favorite uh, character. Definitely split between Han Solo and Boba Fett. Harrison Ford, I can't say enough about. You know, women, it's, it's obviously the era of strong women and empowered women, et cetera, et cetera. And God bless. Um, but for us, it was the alpha male. And there was nothing wrong with that at all. You know, I read a horrible article a few years ago in regards to, you know, negating uh, uh, Indiana Jones and, and Han Solo saying, oh, my God, it's toxic or whatever. He was amazing. <laughs> he was an alpha. He had charisma. Uh, he was absolutely amazing. And his career has been absolutely incredible. And I, I miss alpha men like the, the man that was Harrison Ford. Yeah, um, yeah. When we're going into the world of sci-fi, there was nothing better than Boba Fett. I mean, what kid did not like a figure with a jetpack? And also the unique colors and the mystery of him, you know, with the mask and everything else. Yeah, it's the mask, man. The slave, the slave one as well. Uh, so it's a definitely, I always say it's a tie between Boba and uh, Han. You're not going to say yourself at this point? Uh, you know, it, it <laughs> it's, it's a good story about that in terms of putting myself aside where I had the option to not wear the mask for my character. Yeah. And because uh, they were rushing me to set. And I, I went back to the costume designer because initially it was called, it called for the, uh, the mask. And I could have gotten more face time and screen time, but for me, it's the same thing. And that just even in a relationship, I don't, I don't put me first. It's about the whole story, and it's about the power and the power of the character. I, I, say, I think you made a good choice going with the mask, because mask characters stand out, and yours, as we can see behind you, definitely has that look where people are gonna be like, "Who is that guy?" Yeah, you know, six foot four, and uh, you know, I, I, this is the first time I no disrespect to Dengar, uh, Bosk, or Forlom, or Zookas, but this is the first time you have a six foot four bounty hunter. Uh, so hopefully I'm, I'm God willing the black series and uh, Funko pop and, and uh, oh, heck uh, yeah. Seven five Hasbro will hopefully catch on, you know, we're in such a gray area and we can talk about it later, but uh, you know, again, it's just one of those side characters, just like, a lot of the cantina aliens and such were well, uh, the bounty hunters you just mentioned too. I mean, let, let's, let's be real. They were just standing there. The only one that had a remote line was Boba. So, and look how much we all love IG, Dangar, Zuckus, Forlom now. So you, you've got potential, man, especially with that look, that look is, it, it, it pops off the screen. I mean, we even caught you in the, in the, the teaser they ran. What was that? Two weeks ago, you got a little spot in there. Yeah, I, I can't tell you how tense it is for the family and I, you know, because, again, you just don't know where it's going to go. You talk to non-Star Wars fans. That's like my worry. Uh, and again, I will take the criticism as it comes to where, you know, I've, I've had a, a numerous guest stars on television. I've had recurring roles with Superstore, Jimmy Kimmel Live and, you know, really solid guest stars with major network television shows. Um, but my only concern, I guess, as a, as a legitimate actor is. You know, I don't know. It's like that one date, you know, I mean, well, fortunately, I, I don't think you and I have had that where it's like, that's it, you know. <laughs> but at the yeah. same time, within the Star Wars universe, it's just like, wow, you know, that, that your shots look amazing. The 501st, I was in tears uh, last week because I, I had a drink with one of them. They had a screening in L.A., Chicago, New York. They saw the first first three episodes and they really assured me that we've got some really beautiful shots coming up. Awesome. Friday. Awesome. I can't that's wait. How grateful I am. And I, I'll be happy to tell you the whole story about that in terms of how that might not have happened because there was a cut after the first week that unfortunately, thank God, Deborah Chow, who's now heading up Kenobi, um, selected me because if that didn't happen, 
we would have just had those obscure shots from the trailer as well as episode one. Which, yeah, yeah, we'll get into that. So yeah. the last thing kind of setting you up here, speaking of your acting career, which people, by the way, check him out on IMDb. He's got 86 plus credits, I believe. Yes. And as he said, I, you've seen Dominic on a TV show in your life. I guarantee it. Yes. I mean, he's been on pretty much every primetime show, network show out there. So check him out. So, Dominic, the whole acting thing, do you feel like your your Star Wars fandom kind of pushed you into that career or you just like being a creative, getting up in front of people and doing your thing? Yeah. Um, you know, the inspiration of John Williams and the 80s movies, I can't say enough about what really what pushed me over the top was it was the perfect musical for an Italian-American when I was 16 years old. I played Danny Zuko in high school. I had 1,000 of my classmates and teachers and parents and coaches cheering me on. Uh, I was a good singer. I wasn't great. I just I was just under the cusp of Broadway. You have to be, one of the keys with acting is you have to be honest with yourself and your ability and such. Um, but it was enough to, to kick ass at this high school musical. Uh, when I was 18 years old, I went to one year of college at Marist College in Poughkeepsie. I just kept feeling the adrenaline rush. I actually, it was a cattle call for the Blair Witch Project, believe it or not, I didn't realize it was Blair Witch at that time, but 400 people deep. And you'd think I would be crazy to want to pursue that business after that line down on Lafayette Street, New York City. <laughs> back to the 90s. Normally, you'd be like, you know what, I'm going to pick a different occupation. Yeah. But during the weekends, instead of partying and going to the, all these keggers with the frat boys who wanted me to join the fraternities, I just kept going down to the city. And there was a, a, a newspaper called Backstage to where the, uh, NYU was doing short films or Columbia. And little by little, it was just my curiosity for anyone in occupation. I was just so hungry to learn and want to grow within this uh, this art form. And more and more film started becoming more appealing to me than theater. Um, a theater was great. I mean, it's great to it, uh, you know exercise the muscle, but there was something for me that was very rich in terms of something that's going to be long lasting that I can show people and just also being up on the big screen. Um, it's been a, a really long journey. I've been a blue collar actor when I call, I call myself that because in between every guest star, all those 86 credits I'm so proud of. But in between, I promised my wife uh, I had survival jobs all throughout these 25 years. Everything has been very humbling in between those jobs. I can get a guest star on 911 on Fox or you know NYPD Blue or The District or whatever. Uh, but at the same time, there's not one day that goes by to where I act like some diva out here in terms of thinking I'm above it all. On Tuesday or Wednesday, if I'm not working, I've got a dear friend of mine, a character actor, Franco Vega. It's some of the most grueling work. He owns a moving company or, you know, whether it's Uber or whether it's uh, Instacart, whatever it is, in order right. for me to keep it going, keep the dream alive. But at the same time, um, to always constantly stay grounded and stay humble. And that's uh, 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 subsequently how I ended up getting this this job uh, in Star Wars. It's like you're reading my mind, man. That's that's we're segueing right into it. So yep. so why, why don't you tell the people, how did you score this job? Because it is kind of a, an interesting story. Yeah, so just like the popular click in uh, high school or whatever, uh, my agent, my former agent, uh, had that mentality. Once you book a guest star, they're thinking for themselves, and I don't have any disrespect for that. If, you ha if you're part of a firm, you know, say a law firm, they're going to tell you, oh, don't take that case. That's going to make you look bad. Well, it's the same thing with actors where they say, you know, you have a guest star credit now. As guest stars now, we want to shoot for series regulars. So even my friend, I worked on Barry. I was a featured uh, um, Chechen in that uh, season one and two. It was great. A lot of fun. But even the same thing, he was just like, um, hey, you have to hold out for the bigger roles. Otherwise, they're just going to consider you as a co-star. Co-stars are like two or three lines. For me, it, you know, there was an old 1955 film called Marty where he pushed away his friends and said, you know what? I'm happy doing this the way that I want to. I'm happy with this girl that's not very popular. So for me, I take any kind of work. This happened to be a simple makeup test with a company called Legacy Effects. Legacy Effects, one of the top in the business. They've been around for 20 plus years. Marvel, Disney, every major motion picture. I worked with them years ago on Van Helsing. I doubled uh, Frankenstein uh, opposite Hugh Jackman and one of my dear friends, Will Kemp. Um, I worked on uh, Bright uh, with one of the orcs and also Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I was one of the Kree. Sad, Anyhow, I told you people this guy gets busy. Yeah, it's all, you know, get, get our hands dirty. I, I always joke that I have no idea where all the diva attitude came with in terms of being an actor. For me, it's a blue collar job. Yeah. Whatever I have to do in order to survive, yeah, I do. You can feel that the way you talk about it, too. I mean, hell, you're, you're talking to us, so you're, you're definitely, you don't have that, hey, I'm too good for everybody now. So I mean, we appreciate that. And you can tell from your personality, your, your social media post. Yeah. Definitely a, a genuine dude. So 
Yeah. I'm sorry to, to kind of interrupt you on the story here. So you you got called in for a makeup test. Was it a paid gig that, to kind of help them test the makeup, or you just oh, help absolutely. Friend? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's paid for one day. There was no guarantee. There was no words in terms of if there's another project, uh, if there was any more work that was going to be involved. Um, I had no idea. I just thought Marvel kept expanding their universe, that it was going to be another spinoff of Marvel, and maybe I was referred by being a Cree. I, you know, I, I'm very patient in the chair. But anyhow, the guy who was doing me, his name was Brian Sipe. Brian headed up Drax. Um, uh, David Batista in the chair. Uh, he had about 90 uh, different prosthetics, uh, each the same, his same uh, Drax outfit. Uh, and, and Brian headed up all of that for Drax over in Atlanta. Yeah, yeah. So anyhow, we just hit it off, you know, just humble, appreciative, respectful. Um, you know, we're not on our phone. We're not, you know, no attitude whatsoever. Anytime, you know, come to work, he split my face in two over the course of six hours. We're working with different makeup uh, styles on one side and then prosthetics on the other. Uh, after he would do one uh, style on each side, I would have to go into another room and take photos. Uh, long story short, I shook his hand. I have a business card. I just said, hey, Brian, just in case, whatever this is, you know, I'd love to work with you. You're such a cool guy. <laughs> um, two weeks later, I get a phone call for a screen test. Now, mind you, screen tests are very, very high budget films. I have never in my life at the major league level had a screen test. A screen oh, okay. Test, you have to have the entire cast and crew, which costs yeah. probably probably a hundred to $200,000 to hire everybody just for a test. Normally, even for, uh, um, I did the WB there, uh, the Looney Tunes with LeBron just recently, you show up for set. I mean, that's it. Uh, space, whatever the hell it's space, space jam, jam two or whatever. Yeah. Space jam two. You just show up even for that. It's like, we're not doing screen tests. That's a lot of money. So I'm just like, okay, this is really interesting. So I show up, uh, sign up, uh, over an NDA and, uh, all these doors were closed at Manhattan Beach studios. And I thought that was really eerie in terms of there were code names on every door. It wasn't like, uh, it was like Mr. Blue or, or, or Dave, or just very weird character names uh, on all the dressing room doors. And then also the wardrobe room was closed. So uh, a very interesting gentleman who actually acts, is an actual, I'm sorry, a legend in uh, uh, costuming. His name is Richard A. Pora. And he uh, is headed up uh, Orville, uh, previous Star Wars uh, uh, job, uh, you know, um, gigs. He brought me into his office just separately. And every Star Wars fan would be able to connect the dots at that point when I looked on the wall. It wasn't until I walked into the other room <laughs> that uh, there was a rack with three options of clothing and it said my name and it all next to it, it said Bounty Hunter. And oh. it was really, um, it, it's funny because, you know, again, as a Star Wars fan, you have to keep your composure. I've been a professional for 20 plus years, but this was really something that was very overwhelming for me and I needed to take a breath for a oh, second. Oh, probably kicked because, your ass, huh? Yeah, I, had, I didn't know if I was going into episode nine. I did not know at the time. I heard Favreau, but I heard a rumor of maybe a Boba Fett-like movie. Um, but anyhow, long story short, these three options of clothing, two of them had me completely masked. They had kind of this like Tatooine-esque kind of feel to it with a very uh, thin visor to where I'd be breathing out, you know, like Chewbacca, I mean, to where it was really gonna be uncomfortable. Right. But Came up and it was the first time I saw I saw him on you know in on the project and he said no no, no we're going to give Dominic a prosthetic and he comes to me he said Dom he said you were so patient in the chair I'm going to give you the most extensive prosthetic of all the <laughs> so but the thing that I ask and you know I've said in a couple articles is how do you thank a man after you've only met him you know once or twice who has given you a gift that is more special than a gift that can come from your mother your wife anybody yeah. your children uh, you know so how do you thank that person and of course. You know, it's, it's not the old days where, you know, you, 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 you know, you, you buy something for them. It would be like bribery, you know, but I just was so overwhelmed in terms of the opportunity. So I get into this uh, costume. Richard uh, gave me the bandolier, the signature Star Wars, you know, kind of a piece of a of wardrobe. Um, I got I had forearm shields. I want to go through a whole tutorial on Saturday for all the cosplayers, because anyone who would cosplay me in, in a convention, I promise you a complimentary autograph. My agents are going to kill me. But I, a, a complimentary <laughs> autograph and a complimentary photo. Uh, just to make the character iconic, and and that for me would be such a dream come true. Oh, it's got it, it's gonna happen. I know it will. Yeah. So so anyhow, he did a project, Brian, two years prior, a Greenpeace project where he had a female model with two humps on its her, her head and a paint uh, uh, sequence that was very similar to a gecko. And the, there were the humps humps on the head, and that's what he wanted to do to me. He showed me the photo. It was the same paint sequence. It was the same bumps. So this is this is day one. Uh, of the screen test, and they wanted me to, they gave me the blue, this blue robe with a hood, and they wanted me to do a reveal. They wanted me to stay in character. I was in the back of this, uh, it was kind of this moisture farm where they wanted me to just kind of role play a little bit as, as a bounty hunter, imposing, tough, whatever. Uh, so Pavro was there, Filoni, and Deborah Chow, and anyhow, I do the reveal, and I get a little snicker from the, the bounty hunters, you know, the, the other guys uh. and girls. 
And they said, well, I said, what's the matter? They said, Dom, they said, not for nothing. The humps will look a little bit like boobs. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. You know? <laughs> So I go to Brian. I said, Brian, I said, please, for the love of God, I said, please, I, I'm not trying to overstep my bounds. I said, but I'm six foot four. I'm 260 pounds. This character can be very much badass. I said, is there any way at all you can please take the humps and maybe perhaps uh, do something? I don't care what you do with it, but if there's any way that you can kind of alter it to any, you know, way other than <laughs> looking like a D cup, to where I'm gonna be, you know, because uh, then I wouldn't even be sitting here talking to you, you know. Yeah. So thank God, come Monday. Uh, it was there. And then two special gifts on the day one. Number one, I, I wish, again, every Star Wars fan could have this option and hopefully they'll make a video game uh, you know, similar. And I'm sure they have already to where you can pick your weapon. But I, I, my dream for every Star Wars fan is to be able to pick your own lightsaber within the universe. But for me, I, I, I was one of the first to get to the prop table and laying in front of me were about 20 blasters and I got to pick my own blaster. Uh, I, I picked the biggest one. It had a paintball canister in the back and a curved dagger down by the mag. I have one company, a 3D printing company. They're going to uh, recreate it for me. I wish I could nice. have uh, had the, the original there. Um, but uh, at the same time, when I go into the cantina, uh, standing there was none other than George Lucas on day one. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, and it just was uh, really, I, I, I mean, I, I said you can count on one hand how many people literally at, can have a budget of that level to where almost like they're God. You know, you can say J.K. Rowling, Steven Spielberg, maybe James Cameron, George Lucas and maybe, you know, Favreau to where literally they can create their universe at that budget. And to be one of their creatures, one of their characters was such an honor. I met him 15 years prior. At this level, you do not talk. You know, I mean, you, you, whatever they say, you know, you, you, they say jump, you go how high, you know, you ask how high. It's right. a hundred million dollar budget. So people ask me, oh, did you go up and chat with everybody? It's like, no, you, you got to respect when you're at that level. You have to respect that budget at any project you're on, um, as, meta, as well as the crew, these these grips. The unsung heroes, uh, you know, they're working, they're busting their butt. You don't do anything to to create more time. You know, you're just there. But I'll tell you, with Inside, I was like a 10-year-old kid just taking it all in. A cantina, <laughs> George Lucas, talking to Favreau about Mandalorians. And I'm there as like a unique character. It really was just beyond words. That, that truly is a dream come true for most of us. So I'm, I'm happy one of us got to experience that. So <laughs> that that was, was that your first day filming or is that still the screen test? Uh, no, no, that was the first day filming on Monday to where they changed up my horns. Um, the day, the week before was the screen test and Favreau, thank God, gave the seal of approval. And then, uh, we moved on to the next phase there, which was, uh, the cantina scenes there, which you've already seen within the trailer. And then also episode one. Right. At this point, we can assume that's essentially griefs, the, the kind of the bounty hunter guild hideout or cantinas at how they're, cause they haven't even given us planet names yet, at least in the show. I mean, we don't yeah. know where he's been yet so far, where he's been on at least three planets. We have no idea which yeah. ones. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was thrown um, because, you know, there'll be a, a series that a scene that comes up where I thought maybe it's Tatooine, but the dirt was black. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, again, that was kind of threw me off in terms of is it Tatooine? Is it not? You know, we're in a cantina. But again, I mean, they, you know, there's bars all over the place. You know, there's right. Bars okay. Boston, yeah. But that is kind of the that is kind of grief's spot then or at least yes. where the bounty hunters come to mingle and get their pucks and so on and so forth the bounty hunter guild yes exactly yeah you've kind of mentioned some of this but being such a fan was it hard to focus that day yes um for a couple of reasons number one obviously being a fan number two you know i've had situations before to where you don't make the cut um there was a, a great movie called uh, collateral with tom cruise where i yeah. have a bald head uh, the problem is Tom Cruise and I have a very, very a different height level. And I did a lineup for Michael Mann to where it was down to like three guys to who's going to um, get shot by Tom Cruise. And to me, that would have been awesome, you know. Um, and it, obviously, they didn't go with me. And, and again, no hard feelings at all. It is what it is. It's not like I go home and start crying. But this one, you know, your heart is in your, your chest, uh, you know, <laughs> or in your stomach because you obviously want to be established. So what transpired after about four days of these shots um, was that there, we needed to do a lineup because there was a sequence, which you will see on the third episode, uh, directed by the amazing Deborah Chow, um, to where she wanted to isolate the bounty hunters. And thankfully, because of the extensive makeup, it was nothing personal against my peers. They need to eat just like I do. Um, I was selected. And little did I realize now, uh, being a little out of focus in the first episode, how important that was in order to have my, my character established. Um, so it really, it's funny because I look back on it now to where I didn't really, you know, I was like, ah, whatever. I mean, if I don't get it, I, you know, I'll look for work next week and figure out what I'm doing or whatever. But now realizing 
how special it is to where now we can potentially be an action figure, potentially have our own trading card, um, you know, and obviously have the honor of being alongside the legendary Carl Weathers as an Italian-American. Rocky series for me was so amazing, and he was 50% of why that series was amazing, um, and, and not to mention his presence, his talent, and, and also Boba being my favorite character. Right. This is where I wish I could have taken everyone's heart and, and mine and put it into mine in terms of, you know, when I act, when I perform, you get what's called like sort of a tunnel vision to where you, the universe starts going away. I mean, the real world goes away and all of a sudden you start locking in, you start focusing within your character. And there was just some really magical moments with that because the whole world went away and I'm sitting here staring like in my childhood playset. set. Uh, <laughs> I can only imagine, man. I'm trying to relive the experience through you and just seeing how happy you are in your facial expressions. I mean, it had to have been a dream come through, come true. I was going to ask, was this the second best day of your life? Uh, yeah, <laughs> the first best day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I didn't want to get you in trouble with anybody, you know, no, but... Yeah, the birth of my sons obviously was uh, uh, obviously a dream. That's what I was kind of getting at. So yeah, that's yeah, like the yeah, second out there. But, uh, yeah, it it sincerely was, and that's why I think Disney hasn't said anything. There's enough media out there now to where I think I would have gotten a letter from Disney being like, "Dude, you know, you got to chill." But I think they understand that it's like literally being a kid in a candy store, genuinely wanted to do good, to genuinely wanting to get involved with the 501st and the Mercs um, over the course of the next few years and see what we can do in terms of charities. Uh, if my signature can can you know help a kid maybe uh, you know pay for his medical bills or whatever for a silent auction, uh, sign me up. I'm right there. So uh, I think they understand that and they just understand my goodwill and also my professional attitude, not only on set but also uh, throughout the course of all the interviews there. I will say that I thought, uh, I mean now I think I mean without giving any spoilers away because obviously we've seen one and two, uh, episode one and two. I really thought that the baby, you know, the baby, I had no idea what it was other than a baby. And right. what I was thinking was that it was going to be a great uh, story buildup for either Ray, Finn or Poe. And I thought that maybe we're going to have the magic of the history of Poe, Finn and where maybe where Ray came from. You know, so I was like, oh, wow, I like where this is going. Little did I know, it's now taking the freaking world by storm. Yeah, dude, it went like way over here. I don't think any of us had any clue they'd go in, in Yoda baby direction. Not to mention the most, I mean, how, you know, how do you compete with this? Hopefully I'll get my own gift, but it's like, how do you compete with this most adorable thing I know. on it, the freaking planet? I it's mean, ridiculous. Just the way, yeah, these visual artists, they made him. I mean, it's just the, the mannerisms are just so baby-like where normally it could be like annoying or kind of look like the Grinch where it's kind of ugly and standoffish, but they just made it so much like a baby right. that it's just like, you can't stop looking at it, you know? Yeah. I mean, Favreau just put out some concept art of him today. He looks just yeah. as adorable in that. I mean, do you, do you know, uh, was he an actual physical prop? He looked, I think in episode two, I mean, he looked like a puppet. Um, no, I, I, I mean, at least from what I saw, it was just basically a, a swaddled, uh, you know, and you'll, you'll see it in three. I mean, you know, again, I don't want to give anything more or less away, but I mean, I think we could talk about that. It was just sort of swaddled in Mando's hand. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah and, and that's why Favreau, I think, made a, a comment about a day or two ago that he was surprised. Uh, nobody gave it away, but I think only the upper crust of production knew exactly what it was. As far as us, we just thought it was a baby. And, um, you know, he definitely at least what you knew as the actor was that Mando had a heart uh, because obviously he did not want to, um, he, you know, he's, he's, he, he's creating sort of a, a friendship with this, this thing. Otherwise, oh, yeah. I, he would have just let IG-11 uh, blow it away. There, there's some I, this is we're getting into some fan talk here, but there's some interesting going on to where someone has been sending these other bounty hunters with kill orders for the baby where the initial deal was we want it alive. Yeah. So there, there's something going on. I'm sure we may find out. Maybe we'll get something in Dominic's episode. But moving yeah. on, I mean, you, you talked about there were some big, big wigs on set, and clearly you couldn't talk to them. I mean, George was there. W was I mean, Kathy but, there too, or, or John, but, but, David? Uh, Kathleen Kennedy, uh, yeah, John and Dave were there at all the, every single day. Um, uh, but let me just clarify also, that not that you didn't would talk to them, but the, the, the tone was extremely pleasant. This was not back in the 1980s or 90s with Michael Bay or James Cameron, where, you know, don't get me wrong, when you have a $100 million budget, I don't right. blame shouting. I've been on sets where that happens in terms of people are passionate. There's a lot of money at stake. But I cannot tell you how pleasant the experience was and how professional. And also, if for those listening, in regards to diversity, this was the first time I ever saw a female first assistant director and a female second assistant director and a female camera operator, who, by the way, I need to look her up uh, after episode three because 
she there would be certain shots to where I could, you know, you you obviously are planted a certain way. You can't say, you know, cheat over so much. But she would little by little kind of inch me over one way or the other because she wanted to make sure that my character was established. <laughs> Look I'm at you. You, to... you had everyone on your side. Everyone's on Dominic's side to get this this character in frame. And it, yeah, it sounded it, like it worked. Yeah. And, and like I said, I can't tell you how grateful I am for everybody. You know, I'm from New York and, I, you know, no knock to New York. But a lot of times, especially in my culture, Italian, people aren't necessarily rooting for you. And I just cannot tell you how many people over the past month have just been so they've just extended like we, we cannot wait to see you or we're so supportive of your character. Even people that would have loved to have been in my shoes. For people to do that really says a lot about the Star Wars community as a whole in terms of being so generous that they care about my well-being. They care about me. And and I can't tell you enough how much I will promise to pay that forward moving forward. It's just really overwhelming. It's it's emotional because, again, where I come from, we have a you know real tough chip. When you come up in the ranks from New York. Oh, yeah, there's a little bit uh, of an edge edge to you. You do, and not everybody's rooting for each other. The Italian pride, the Italian ego, unfortunately. I even had a guy leave a some kind of slick comment the other day where I just blocked him right away. It was just kind of like, you know, I mean, it was just passive aggressive, you know. Um, but I'm not used to that personality. But I, I've enjoyed L.A. because for me, I've always been that person that does that to give back and to want to help and watch you achieve as well. It's, it's not about me. Um, so for everyone to support me, and again, Friday is so important in terms of becoming canon, becoming fan fiction, uh, people, you know, illustrating my character and hopefully pitching it uh, to Disney to where we can get a, a black series just due to the limited time that we're on screen um, just means the world. And I can't tell you how grateful I am for that. Yeah, man, you're, you're going to be immortalized in Star Wars fandom. And that that's something pretty, pretty special to think about. So, I mean, I, I've been happy for you and I don't know you outside of social media. I mean, I was introduced to Dominic from, I think his name's Spencer Barron on Instagram. He just, he yeah. followed us there and he said, Hey, I've got a buddy that that's in the Mandalorian. Would you want to interview him? I said, sure. Yeah. And sure enough, we, we got the chat and through Instagram and here we are. So, I mean, Dominic is as genuine as it gets. Yeah. Moving back to your, your first day on set, did yeah. you get to interact with Pedro or Carl at all? I mean, assuming you're. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with Carl, we talked briefly about where we live. Um, you know, Carl is a, a professional through and through. You can feel the focus. I've had the privilege of being on set with Denzel two times. One was uh uh, he did a lawyer, uh, uh, Esquire movie a couple of years ago, uh, Roman Israel. And then also there was a movie back in New York uh, called The Siege. There was a certain level of respect for the stars, whether I'm starring in the film or whether you're starring in the film. Um, there's an overall level of silence. And th that silence is so that the lead actors can concentrate. With that being said, every now and then there might be an interaction or a nod. But it's just a level of respect when you're at that level that you don't necessarily chatted up. We talked a little bit about where we live and about the traffic in L.A., et cetera, uh, during episode three's shoot. Um, but ultimately, it, you can feel the energy of the actor. And a lot of times when they're focused, especially when you have sometimes, you know, uh, seven or eight pages to memorize within a day, um, you give them that respect. You don't, you know, go up to them and, and sit there and, and start uh, shooting the breeze and such. Um, Pedro, I, <laughs> I, I don't I can't really talk about it. I, I don't think I can talk about it in terms of uh, who was there and who wasn't in regards to when yeah. he on. So forgive me. Fair enough. Fair enough. We don't want to get you in trouble. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry did, about that. Did anything interesting happen on that day of shooting such as say like an unscripted scene tweak or maybe some personalities clashing or was it, I mean, it sounds like it was pretty uh, jovial. Let's get the work done. No one was kind of cracking the whip, but did, did they change a scene? Did someone go, I got a better idea. Let's do this. No, it was it was such a tightly run ship. You can feel Filoni and Favreau. Uh, there was a great book that I read years ago for for restaurant management. Uh, it was called Setting the Table, and there was this one great phrase called constant gentle pressure, where you are leading your team in a way where you are pushing them, but also at the same time you're very gentle. And that's what I got from Dave and John in terms of just being masters of the craft, hiring with talent to where everyone is on the same page, like a tightly run military ship. Um, in terms of interesting stories, at least for my own um, uh, character. Uh, I, I had this Rudy Rudiger moment to where I think every Star Wars fan will be able to rate where there's a little bit of action. And the stunt coordinator, I was not hired as a stuntman, even though I've done uh, stunts in the past, uh, you know, different uh, crime dramas and, and uh, uh, a movie for sci-fi a couple of years ago. But anyhow, he, there was a certain scene where he's like, look, he said, if you, you know, if you want to get down on one knee on this situation, you can take it easy. And I <laughs> had this Rudy uh, quote to him. And I said, I said, sir, I said, first of all, you know, my name is Dominic. Feel, feel free to look me up. I've done a few stunts, you know, here and there. 
I said, but I've been waiting for this my whole life. I said, so any 10 year old kid, I yeah. don't care if I have to jump off a two story building. I'm getting in down. Star Wars, my, <laughs> favorite, my favorite scene of all time was the skiff scene. And uh, that was the first time I ever heard a crowd applaud in the theater in 1983 with Luke and where he comes to save the day and takes out all the, you know, the, the side characters, Klaatu and, and Boba and everything else. And, and for me, it's like, if I can have the same applause, you know, or, or somebody when they see this scene, um, uh, do, okay, I, yes, I, I, yes. So my blaster, you know, the, the uh, paintball canister, which is attached to the back, uh, because I went all out a few times, props was totally okay with it, but I cracked it about three or four times. <laughs> in between, I blew it uh, quickly there uh, in between. So if there's any stories, that uh, essentially was it, but just because of my passion uh, of just telling the stunt guy, listen, man, there 100% no effort. You know, there was one death, I mean, not to knock uh, any, any performances in... in um, uh, any Star Wars episodes, but in, re in the Sith, um, uh, in the third episode, uh, it, 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 there was one Jedi who died, and she fell in such a way, or she just kind of, the action was in a way that just seemed like it, it wasn't believable, you know? And yeah. for me, especially if people are going to watch this a million, five million trillion times over, it's like, I did not care. Uh, my knees were banged up and my ribs, et cetera, but I said, you know, I'm going all out, man. He just, sold it. He saw, I yeah, can't wait. Yeah, and the adrenaline was, obviously, you can feel that it was just so much there, you know? I bet. So, I mean, you, you kind of, I think you answered part of this, but you didn't get to bring anything back with you. No no props, nothing, uh, uh, costume. The only, the only thing I had, and there was a diehard Star Wars fan in Chicago, was a little dirt in my shoe. It was black dirt. Um, but no, I mean, it's all property of Lucas, and that's something to where, you know, yeah, you'll get you'll get blackballed for that, yeah, and, and I, rightfully so. You know, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I would give anything to have the crown of my prosthetic of my head um, or my blaster without question, which is owned by Legacy Effects. But thankfully, to uh, you know, I'm so grateful for technology now with all these 3D printers um, giving a detailed explanation. And I, I believe that in one shot, I'm going to have my blaster really clearly seen. Um, that's going to be just as much amazing. Uh, and I have several people doing it to where I want to be able to sign a few and donate it to charitable charitable. Awesome. Call as well so yeah yeah i mean these days like you said with 3d printing they can essentially match the quality of the prop makers so exactly. you'll, you'll be good to go so at this point have you commissioned a full-on cosplay outfit for yourself or are you trying to do it for other people to cosplay off of your character uh for other people i mean this was a two-hour process i i'm not a big cosplayer I, i'm a huge fan I, I love going to the conventions i've signed at a few of the conventions i've done a couple of sci-fi projects and also you know throughout my career i've had a little bit of uh, uh you know decent credits here and there um but no this is for the cosplayers i can't tell you how much i enjoy the star wars fan base i was at celebration in chicago meeting with a illustrator to talk about potentially um you know drawing my project as you can see some of the illustrators have done an amazing job of oh yeah it. i mean dominic already has a lot of fan art being made for his character so and, yeah. and, and, and the world hasn't even seen him yet so just wait until friday when the episode drops so so my illustrator uh he was an hour late but i just had the pleasure of sitting outside and watching for an hour the fans coming in and i've been a fan but just to see the joy on the, the kids faces and and grown-ups of all ages of how this series brings everybody together was just it was cold in chicago it was march um but just it was such a beautiful beautiful experience um just to see the enthusiasm even when i was in high school you know i got along with everybody i didn't have any you know uh, issues with clicks here and there but the people that i love the most it didn't have to be sci-fi but just if you were passionate about something and those are the people I enjoy surrounding myself around is that you're enthusiastic about something in life. I didn't like that girl or that guy who was too cool for school to where you're rolling your eyes all the time and looking at your hair in the mirror, um, you know, needing your Instagram uh, duck face pictures to, uh, you know, uh, be 500 every freaking day with your story. I don't want to say it. <laughs> but I, I was not a fan of that woman. I was not a fan of that man, you know, where it's just, oh, yeah, I'm so good. for this. It's like, no, I want to be around you who is passionate about whatever it is because you're enjoying life. And, and, and to share in that now, to go on this whole literally world tour uh, starting hopefully next week, starting in London, uh, is this going to be such a joy oh, for boy. me? Oh, boy. Awesome. Uh, to meet, yeah, to meet so many people. I'm, I'm, I, I have four representatives. Uh, they're all kind of fighting over me now. They're a little upset. But I said, listen, I just want to take every opportunity because I'm, I'm like a kid in a candy store to right. be around conventions and be around other fans and actors and such. Is this going to be a dream come true? Yeah, I'd say these are good problems to have right now, Dominic. Good problems yeah. to have. Absolutely. All right, so let's kind of zero in on your bounty hunter, the guy that we hope becomes infamous like a Dangar, an IG-88, a Forlom. Yeah. Yeah. Were you given any sort of plot information while you were filming that day? 
Yes. And the good thing is, you know, I call it like a, my own Venom experience. I posted something the other day. This guy did this amazing graphic, which half my face and half uh, uh, the bounty hunter. And the joke that I have going now is just that my bounty hunter would not like me. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's like, no, you're too nice. You're, dude, get the frig out of the body. So I literally, even during the situation, and if you see some of my work, it's like I'm completely different. I, I turn a whole coin. It's like uh, Stallone and over the top where he, once he turns the hat, you know, it's a whole different image and, and, a, and a persona. Um, due to the plot and due to the situation, um, this bounty hunter to me is completely unapologetic and will do anything he can, whether it's, again, man, woman, or child, in order to get that money. Um, I yeah, do yeah. not see him being sympathetic at all. I do not see him being like Mando in terms of having any sense of a compassion or empathy at all. Um, ideally, in a perfect world, the people ask me the way that I see the character I would love him to speak that Jabba language. I, I don't. I would rather him not speak English. I would love. Guys, so he's a Jabba. he's a Hatti speaker. Yes, at the low tone that that little ball, that protruding ball, can speak. I would Got love it. that to be the translation. Oh um, yeah, because he does have a, an apparatus on his mouth, right? So it would be that kind of mechanical correct voice. So I would love that in terms because due due to my height and my size. Also, at the same time, we have forearm shields. We have the um, the curved dagger for hand to hand combat. Just like me in life, I think it would be less agility with this bounty hunter, but also at the same time, a tremendous amount of power. Yeah, um, as a power like hitter, a, brawler. Jason, Jason from Friday the 13th, and a very, very powerful blaster. So for people uh, you know, that are diehard fans at home, that would more or less be the description. I know for a fact this is a one-of-a-kind species due to the origin of where it came from uh, and the inspiration from the artist, which was outside of Star Wars. Uh, people are trying to place it, but uh, again... I think it's a one-of-a-kind bounty hunter, at least from right now, in the storyline. And in, as far as continuing on, I would love nothing more. And again, you know, I'm, I'm not at the CAA level or William Morris, for those that don't understand, just the highest level of entertainment. Uh, I would love to see him chase Luke or try to have an interaction with Kenobi in the previous series, you know, which takes place before this, to where there might be a little bit more history with him. But uh, either way... I appreciate the fan fiction and people writing about his history, um, part of the Bounty Hunters Guild and how he formed and if he was close to Boba, if he was close to, uh, to uh, Bosk or Dengar. Uh, to me, that would just mean the world to see that play out within all of the uh, fan fiction throughout the world. So does this mystery man, does he have a name or is he going to be kind of like we talked earlier? Is he just named based off appearance, like a hammerhead, a snaggletooth, a, you know, squid face? Well, the nickname, again, like I said, is because it, the original model was Gecko is Gecko. Um, okay. but that's official by Disney. I'm just hoping that that catches. Um, All right. but that was kind of the nickname in the makeup trailer, uh, but not official by Disney. So hopefully the fans will be able to push that through Wikipedia. And uh, I would like it to be Gecko the bounty hunter in a perfect world. I could see that happen. I like it. Gecko. That some stands people, out, I, too. Some people see it a little bit uh, like a badger. But again, if you see this model and I could uh, happy to send you or the fans a photo. I have two pictures of the original model. Uh, she had a gecko in her hand and also on her head. And also that little color thing of even the Geico lizard there, the gecko. Um, uh, you can see that that same color pattern that's similar to my. Yeah, I mean, he, he looks like a badass. I mean, there. I guess when I first saw him, I got kind of the the Zabrik thing going on, you know, the the mall species deal. But I mean, they're not horns, but they are the kind of that head ornament. So correct, yes. And, and we don't know species, like you said. This is brand new for Star Wars, as as much as you know. This is this is it. So you are truly a unique and one of a kind type of guy. I mean, I guess we could compare him to a a Zuckus, right? We we haven't seen any other Zuckuses out there. Correct. And, and, what, and, and like I said, I mean, that was really what made it special, was not only to be a part of Star Wars, but to be one of a kind. And, and again, you know, people keep asking me, you know, it's like winning the lottery. And, and they ask me in regards to, you know, oh, is there going to be more? Is it going to be this? It's like I, I just come from a very humble background to where this in and of itself, I, I mean, I'm not lying right now. I, I'll tell you the 100 percent truth. If there was an option for me to return or a Star Wars fan to return, I would give it to a Star Wars fan because, I, I really, for me, I don't know if it's cultural or whatever. It's just about sharing the joy. I can't, I, I've been in some exotic places. I've had some of the best dinners all over the world. I, there's no joy for me unless I can share it with somebody. So I, I hope that whether my character continues or not, 
I would love to see another Star Wars fan be a one of a kind character. That's a very refreshing outlook on life, Dominic. I appreciate that. And and honestly, if I could grow another foot and put on a hundred pounds, I would I would ask if I could reprise the role. But I I'm pretty short compared to you, so yeah, it ain't gonna got- happen for me. Maybe I could be uh, an adolescent baby Yoda or something. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right. So, I mean, we, we've kind of been talking about this and I think you think and I think it, but let's let's hear it again. I mean, do you think this guy is going to stand out solely based on his looks on Friday? Will there be a buzz about Dominic Pace's Star Wars bounty hunter? Oh, God, I'm hoping, man. We're, we're so cutting it close. And it's just the story of my career to where the screen time, I think, is just enough to where I think we're going to get in the radar and uh, be able to uh, hopefully make this a, a brand uh, for a very long time to come. Um, but it, and I think because of the limited amount of time the previous episodes have been, uh, along with the, the limited amount of characters that we've seen. I mean, we've seen Jawas, which, OK, we've seen Jawas and Stormtroopers are already familiar with them. Um, I'm hoping that will kind of uh, a pop or protrude the character a little bit more in terms of the fascination, with, especially not to mention we're starting to look a little bit more of, of the fascinating, uh, you know, uh, and, and ever so infamous uh, Bounty Hunter Guild, you know. So I, I'm very hopeful. Um, but again, I'm just kind of uh, laying back on my laurels here, just uh, embracing for whatever happens. But obviously, it'd just be such a dream come true for the fans to embrace it and hopefully a lifetime, uh, a long life career of uh, the conventions and also charitable organizations to where I can make a difference. Heck yeah, man. You'll be in your 70s still still signing autographs like some of these people from the OT. You know, I mean, they're there. They're still in high demand. I mean, doesn't I matter. Be, that, that... I will be in heaven because I love people and I love traveling. I love, uh, you know, I bookmark. I'm such a geek where I, I bookmark different restaurants to try. And different <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, my agent just mentioned to me perhaps uh, Niagara Falls very soon um, where there, I, I think there's a con in Buffalo. And there's an anchor bar up there where they, I think, originated the buffalo wings. So for me, it's just like, that was the first thing I was thinking about. Not even Perfect. I'm like, oh, my God, I can knock that off my bucket list, you know? <laughs> awesome. All right. So what, one more question about the bounty hunter before I let you go. I don't want to keep you here all night, although I'm, I'm having a blast talking to you. Your enthusiasm sure. definitely even pops through the Skype screen here. But yeah. Does your does your bounty hunter have a specialty? You know, Bo- Boba Fett liked his disintegrations. How about yeah. how about your bounty hunter? Um, I would like to believe with the paintball canister of the blaster, um, he has a tremendous amount of power through that blaster. And at the same time, um, the power of Jason to where, you know, or Friday the 13th to where you, you know, if you were dealing with hand to hand combat, yeah, you know, somebody that might be more agile might be able to get at him. But at the same time, if he landed that right hook or the left hook, uh, plus with the forearm guards, I think he would certainly be uh, a force to be reckoned with. So are you saying we may see some melee combat in episode three? Uh, stay tuned. We'll see what I'll see what they, <laughs> they, they, they left in. I got I, I kind of have an idea what may what may go down in episode three. But is it going to be longer than 26 minutes? Do you know that? Uh, that then no. I mean, people are asking me, oh, did you watch playback? It's like there is no way Fabro's like, hey, everybody come over. Like, yeah, yeah. Come here. Check out the look. monitors, guys. Right. Yeah, let's take a look at the last shot. Everybody together. <laughs> think, Dominic? It's like, no. Um, I do not know. I have no idea. But for me, to be honest, I mean, not to be, uh, you know, kind of um, um, skewed, but it's like the shorter the better because I, I like the fact that the fan base is salivating because I think it will uh, heighten the the intensity and, and the, the lore of, of the character there. So I'm actually hopeful that it'll be short again uh, as a little tease. Got yeah. No, I, I mean, the runtimes were surprising to everyone, I think, because I think we all just went with, oh, it's a streaming show, yeah. got to be 50 plus minutes. And then they dropped the first one's 39. Second one, if you cut out the preview, was about 26 minutes. So, yeah. I mean, it's fantastic content, just a little bit shorter than I think we were all looking for. Yeah. With that being said, though, $110 million, I think, was the total budget. So, you know, no matter what, I think you'll definitely get your money's worth throughout the eight episodes. There. Oh, yeah. I mean, in the end, we're, we're, we'll get probably, what, a four to five hour movie for yeah. 110 million that's a deal and it looks more expensive than 110 million i mean the production value has been out of this world that led screen i have perfect vision and i was about 20 feet away from it uh, in herzog's lair there i was uh, just watching that shot um on the day that i was doing a screen test and i'll tell you man you cannot tell the difference even 20 feet away of that it's two-dimensional i mean it literally looks they can create any world up there and it's funny it's like you know if you had a hundred million dollars to create your own soundstage where you can create like your own fantasy land, whatever, up on that screen from all these like MIT guys um, it would just be amazing because when you're there, it still looks like it, it still it looks like you can hop 
right into the screen. It's oh, absolutely- so you, you guys were using some of Favreau's Lion King Jungle Book magic yes. then. Oh, okay. holy hell. All right. Yeah. That's why, I mean, that's why it looks so gorgeous. You know, I mean, when you see this 4K, it's just like, whoa, you know, it's just. Uh, well, you amazing. can't even tell what's practical and not practical yes, at this point because they, they did use a lot of practical. But wow, I didn't oh, know that. Uh, that's impressive. In, in, the, in the trailer with Herzog talking at his desk, you can see like a window behind and all that. That's a that's a screen. And it looks that's like outside. Screen. It looks like our window. Wow. Well, there you go. There's a good little tidbit from Dominic on, on the shooting. I didn't know that. That That's pretty awesome behind the scenes stuff. So. Before we let you go, Dominic, any any key information or things we should be looking for in episode three to let us know that it, that you're coming, that you're um, Green Day yeah, with it, within the cantina, and then there's going to be a situation. <laughs> it's so funny. Uh, uh, Steel uh, Steel Wars there. He's a very uh, famous uh, podcaster there. He's just like, there's going to be a situation, everybody. So that's what I'm saying. There's going to be a situation. So gotcha. uh, all I can say is there's a situation. And also uh, check out for some decent shots in the cantina. From what I understand, there's almost this look I think that I have with Car- uh, Grief uh, Karga. Is that the name? Um, to where almost it looks like I'm in the, almost like the second in command in the guild. Almost that I would be maybe the second most powerful. So that I'm really looking forward to. But this is just coming through the 501st. So um, definitely within the cantina. And then also a situation that's about to go down. So God. without question, the story is definitely going to be moving along. I can promise you that. You heard it here. Once once Mando returns to the cantina, keep your eyes peeled for the gecko, my friends. That's when he may pop up. So, Dominic, again, just want to thank you for taking some time to talk with us at the Star Wars Time Show. Greatly appreciate uh, the, the story you told us. Uh, hopefully people kind of can pick up on the, the level of enthusiasm you have, the love you have for Star Wars, and just being a good human. Because we don't have a lot of those these days, or at least those that are good don't kind of get blast it out there on social media this that and the other thing so thanks again for talking with the star wars time show is there anything we could plug for you coming up i mean social media accounts anything like that uh just the request i mean again my agents might kill me but at least in, for the next few months um i just put in a video uh a clip to a kid that was going through a hard time in a hospital down in texas so if any of you want to email me and say hey you know especially around the holidays things get depressing and sad you know, if there's a way that I can cheer a kid up or, or uh, you know, a grown up or someone, if they're going through a hard time and they just need a video and they're Star Wars fans, uh, just no charge at all. I'm, I'm happy to do that for you. Awesome. I, I just appreciate everyone's support of the character. And uh, thank you so much for tagging this coming Friday. Awesome. Excellent. Yeah, I'll, I'll put some uh, contact information in the post body on StarWarsTime.net that will house this podcast. So those of you, if you want to get in touch with, with Dominic for those types of requests, he, he just offered to do so. So uh, thanks again, man. I, I cannot wait for Friday. I will be up at 6 a.m. when it drops live here in the East. I will be watching it twice, doing my Easter egg recap and then my uh, recap and review after that. And I'll make sure to highlight the get-go so yeah. super excited i'm excited for you uh this has just been a blast so thanks hey. again for coming on thanks for having me have a great night all right see you dominic okay cheers cheers